Tonight, we'll be looking specifically at 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9. A little over 10 years ago now, on a whim, I decided to pick up the phone and call one of my old unbelieving friends from high school. Now, at one point in the conversation, I asked him if he was genuinely happy in life. And his response to me was, yes, he was genuinely happy. And he was ready with reasons to tell me exactly why it was that he was happy. In fact, he gave me three reasons that day. First, he said because he was attending a very prestigious business school. Second, he said because he had plans for after he graduated from that business school. And third, he said because he had a secure financial base, which in his words, quote, makes all the difference. Now, because he was an unbeliever, it didn't surprise me that his happiness in life was directly tied to his circumstances. But as I reflected on that conversation later, I realized that all too often, this is the way that we as Christians live our lives as well. You see, when everything in our lives is going smoothly, we're filled with what we think is the joy of the Lord. But then trials come into our lives. And all of a sudden, that joy is nowhere to be found. It's replaced by murmuring and discontentment and complaining. And yet we know from Scripture that God's desire for us, God's mandate for us, is that we would be those who rejoice in any and every circumstance, including suffering and difficulty and trial. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Paul commands us to rejoice always. In Philippians 4.4, 4, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. In James 1.2, James commands us to consider it all joy when we encounter various trials. And in Matthew 5.12, even Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount commanded us to rejoice and be glad when we're being persecuted for righteousness sake. And so as we look to the word of God, we find that no trial no difficulty, no unpleasant circumstance should ever detract or take away from the abiding joy that we have as believers in Christ. And so for many of us, as we address this issue of seeking to rejoice in the midst of hardships and difficulties and sufferings, the question is not what, but the question is how. In other words, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm to rejoice even in the midst of trials and sufferings but I don't know how to do it. How am I to rejoice in the midst of trials and difficulties and suffering? What steps can I take to prepare myself to be someone who rejoices even in the midst of intense hardship and suffering and persecution? Well, here in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9, Peter answers that very question for us. And so if you want to be someone whose joy is unshaken, both by the major tragedies as well as the minor irritations in this life, then you need to give heed to what Peter says here in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9. And so let me read the text for us. Notice Peter writes, starting in 1 Peter 1, 6, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. And so we find ourselves once again tonight in this larger section of chapter 1, verses 3 through 12, which is really just one long sentence in the Greek text. And the main point of this section is that God is to be passionately praised irrespective of our circumstances or suffering because of the great and grand and glorious salvation that he's wrought for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You see, right out of the gate here, Peter absolutely explodes and erupts in praise to God. Notice verse 3. Blessed, praised, exalted be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word blessed is a Jewish way of 
expressing praise to God. It means to speak well of God, to praise him for who he is and for what he's done. And that blessing that Peter unfolds here goes all the way from verse 3 down to verse 12. But while verses 3 through 12 are one long sentence in the Greek text, it does have three distinct parts to it. The first of which we saw last week in verses 3 through 5, and that is that God is to be passionately praised because he gives and guarantees salvation for us. He gives us the new birth which produces a living resurrection hope within us and he guarantees a lasting inheritance for us because he is keeping both the inheritance for us, verse 4, and he's keeping us for the inheritance, verse 5. Well, that then leads him to the second portion of blessing or praise to God, which begins in verse 6 and goes down to verse 9, which is what we'll be looking at tonight. And here in these verses, we find a most amazing thing. We find something that's not found anywhere in the world. And that is great joy in the midst of intense suffering. Remember, Peter's writing here to both Jewish and Gentile Christians scattered throughout Asia Minor in various churches suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ. And we see that right here in chapter 1, verse 6, which says that they were being distressed by various trials. The word various is the same word that Peter uses in 1 Peter 4, verse 10. And the idea is that they're being distressed by many different kinds of trials. In other words, there's a diversity to their trials. It's not just one kind of trial. For example, chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 3, verse 16, says that they were dealing with slander from opponents. Chapter 2, verse 18, says that they were dealing with unjust masters. Chapter 4, verse 4 says that they were being ostracized and maligned by old friends because of their pursuit of righteousness, that they were no longer running with them in sin. And they were being ridiculed and maligned for that. And eventually the threats and the physical persecution would come as well. And so trials exist. Peter's readers are not unfazed by them. Verse 6 says that they're being distressed by them. They're feeling the grief and pressure of life in a sin-cursed world where people are hostile to Christ and his followers. They're not stoic and unaffected. Times are tough. The persecution is real. They're being distressed by it. They're suffering under it. But notice, shockingly, that Peter writes here in verse 6, you greatly rejoice, even though you have been distressed by various trials. He says you're being distressed by various trials, and yet at the very same time, you're greatly rejoicing. Incredible, what a seeming paradox, right? And notice in verse 6 that they're not just being distressed by trials, but by various trials, by many different kinds of trials. And notice that they're not just rejoicing, but they're greatly rejoicing. And then in verse 8, he says it again, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Again, great joy in the midst of manifold trials and suffering. Great joy in spite of what you're experiencing. It says in verse 6, you greatly rejoice even though you've been distressed by various trials. He says in verse 8, even though you don't see Christ now, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And so Peter is contrasting their internal expression of joy in the promises of God with their current suffering. And so obviously, the reason for their rejoicing is because their joy wasn't tied to their circumstances. Because there was no reason in their current circumstances to rejoice. Rather, their joy was rooted in something far deeper, far more permanent. Namely, in a genuine faith, verse 7, in the unseen. In the unseen hope of a future resurrection. In the unseen promise of an inheritance, verse 4. In the unseen promise of a full and final salvation, verse 5. And in the unseen Christ of verse 8. Notice Peter says in verse 6, In this, that is in this living resurrection hope, verse 3. In this promised future salvation, future inheritance, verse 4. In this promised future and final salvation, verse 5. You greatly rejoice even though now you've been distressed by various trials. And the reason is because your faith in those unseen realities is real. It's genuine. 
Your faith in the unseen reality of your living resurrection hope, verse 3. Your faith in the unseen reality of your promised future inheritance, verse 4. Your faith in the unseen reality of your promised future and final salvation, verse 5, is genuine. It's real. And thus it enables you to rejoice in spite of your current circumstances and suffering. And not only that, but notice in verse 8 that Peter says, And though you have not seen him, that is Christ, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And so Peter says here, because your faith in the unseen Christ is real, it's genuine, it enables you to greatly rejoice in spite of your current circumstances and suffering. And so how is it that Peter's readers are able to rejoice in the midst of such manifold suffering and trials? It's through genuine faith in the unseen realities of a promised resurrection hope, a promised future inheritance, a promised final salvation, and a promised unseen Christ, whom they love and would one day see, verse 7 says, and enjoy forever. And so the only way, folks, to genuinely rejoice in the midst of trials and suffering is through genuine faith. And that's the only one who can truly rejoice in the midst of trial and suffering is the one who possesses this genuine faith. And so how were Peter's readers able to experience this great joy that transcended and rose above their circumstances and suffering? How were they able to not just rejoice, but to greatly rejoice in the midst of manifold trials? I mean, it seems completely counterintuitive, doesn't it? It seems completely paradoxical. Rejoicing greatly in the midst of manifold trials? As we look at both the example of Peter's readers and the reminder that Peter gives his readers, we see several keys to greatly rejoicing in the midst of suffering. In fact, here in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9, Peter provides for us five keys to greatly rejoicing in the midst of suffering. That's what we're going to look at tonight. Five keys to greatly rejoicing in the midst of suffering. And hopefully you have an outline. They're on the back table there so you can follow along. The first key to rejoicing in the midst of suffering is to refocus your hope on your future inheritance, verse 6a. Refocus your hope on your future inheritance, verse 6a. You see, the one who has the most difficult time rejoicing in the midst of trying circumstances is the one whose hope is attached to the here and now. And so in order to be joyful, we must refocus our hope on that which is eternal on that which is beyond this present life, that which cannot be touched or taken by circumstances. By faith, we must focus our hope on the unseen rather than on the seen, namely on our future inheritance, verse 4. As we look at verse 6, we see that it was this kind of focus that served as the basis for the joy of Peter's readers. Notice Peter writes in verse 6a, in this you greatly rejoice. Now, the obvious question is, what does the this refer to? What is the antecedent of this? Well, the this here really points back to the entirety of verses 3 through 5 and the salvation that God has given them and guaranteed for them. The fact that they've been born again to a living resurrection hope, verse 3, and a lasting inheritance, verse 4. Notice back in verse 4 that Peter tells his readers that they've been born again to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. And we looked at that last week. And so this future inheritance of eternal life, eternal salvation, eternal glory that is laid up and promised to all believers, Peter says, is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. And it's reserved for them in heaven. As Peter goes on, he also says that it's certain and secure. It's guaranteed. The end of verse 4, this inheritance is reserved for you in heaven who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And then as we move from verse 5 to verse 6, Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice. In what? And the fact that life is going smoothly? And the fact that everything is going just the way you want it to go? No. In the promise and the expectation of your promised future inheritance and the consummation of your salvation at the return of Jesus Christ. In this you greatly rejoice. You see, in the midst of being distressed by various trials, these believers were able to rejoice because their focus and their hope was not on their circumstances, but on their future inheritance. 
In this, Peter says, you greatly rejoice. You see, if you're distressed and you're discouraged about life, and you go to a, psychi a psychologist, he's going to say, tell me about your past. You go to the apostle Peter, you know what he's going to say? Let me remind you about your future. Because Peter knows that a focus on your future inheritance brings joy to the heart of the one who truly has this hope. You see, their joy in the midst of suffering was rooted in a focus on this future inheritance. And if you and I are going to follow in their footsteps, if we're going to rejoice in the same way, then we need to detach our hearts from the things of this world and refocus our hope on our future inheritance, folks. See, so think of it this way. When we experience the pain and discomfort and suffering and trials of this life, it's because something that we value or cherish here has been taken away from us, right? Maybe that's a person or a relationship or money or physical health or comfort or a goal or a desire or a dream that we had. There's something that we value, something that we cherish, and when it's taken away, we suffer loss and pain. But you see, here in verse 6, we see that when our ultimate hope is fixed and focused upon an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, can never be lost, can never be taken from us, then that hope and that joy is secure, and no circumstance or suffering can touch it or take it from us. As I mentioned last week with the John Newton illustration that I used, when trials and sufferings come into our lives, they're a mere bump or pothole on our journey to the heavenly Jerusalem to inherit all that God is and all that God has for all eternity. And so how foolish we would be to murmur and complain about our trials and suffering in light of the glorious inheritance that awaits us. And so if we want to greatly rejoice in the midst of suffering, we need to refocus our hope on our future inheritance. And let me just say that if you come to the point in the midst of trials where you get so discouraged that you're led into utter despair, it's a pretty good indication that somewhere along the way you've misplaced your hope. Somewhere along the way you've begun to hope in someone or something other than your future inheritance. And so if you want to be restored to the joy that's found in Christ, the joy that transcends circumstances and suffering, you need to refocus your hope on your future inheritance. When Christ returns and you are fully and finally saved and glorified and you get to see and savor and enjoy God for all eternity. Well, secondly, if you want to greatly rejoice in the midst of suffering, remember that your circumstances are only temporary, verse 6b. Remember that your circumstances are only temporary, verse 6b. Now, this might seem obvious and rather simplistic, but we must remember that whatever it is, that we're going through in the present, no matter how difficult it may be, no matter how prolonged it may be, it won't last forever. It's only temporary. And we see this as Peter continues in verse 6. Notice he writes, In this, that is in this living resurrection hope, in this future inheritance, in the consummation of your salvation, you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, you have been distressed by various trials. You see, what Peter does here with this phrase, now, for a little while, is he reminds his readers that their suffering is only temporary. Notice he says two things here. First, he says that their suffering is only now for this present life as opposed to the future and eternity. When they'll experience the consummation of their salvation and no more suffering. And then the second thing that Peter says here is that their suffering is only for a little while. Now, what Peter means by that expression, for a little while, is for the present life as opposed to eternity. He doesn't mean by that expression, for a little while, only one week, or only one month, or only six months, or only one year. No, it's a contrast between what we're experiencing now in this life, and what God has promised for us in eternity and the life to come. You see, in comparison to eternity, an entire lifetime of suffering in this present life is really only for a little while, isn't it? James says in James 4.14 that in comparison to eternity, this life is only a vapor, it's a mist. 
And so Peter says, look, you need to remember that your suffering is only now in contrast to the future, and it's only for a little while in contrast to eternity. And so he seeks to give us an eternal perspective on life in this world and suffering in this world. It's not that we're to close our eyes and to put our head in the sand and pretend that everything is happy-go-lucky and that things are going great. But instead, he says, we're to have an eternal perspective. That is a biblical perspective on suffering. And so Peter emphasizes the brevity of suffering in comparison to eternity. You remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18? He talks about light momentary afflictions. He says that suffering is momentary. That is, it's for this temporal age only and not for the eternal age to come. And he says that it's light. It's not easy and painless, but nevertheless, it's light compared to the eternal weight of glory coming to us. You see, in those verses, Paul is trying to recalibrate our thinking so that we'll be able to view our sufferings in light of eternity. He's not promoting escapism. He's not telling us to simply pretend that our sufferings aren't real or that they're not painful. They are. Rather, he's saying that even the most prolonged and even the most painful of sufferings in this life are but light and momentary afflictions in comparison to the eternal glory that awaits us. They're as light as feathers in a scale and as momentary as mist on a cold winter's morning, he says. Now, as I read that, I'm thinking, are you kidding me, Paul? I've read 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 30, and your laundry list of seemingly never-ending suffering, five times receiving 39 lashes? I can only imagine what your back must have looked like like that in a day without antibiotics. Three times beaten with rods? Ouch! One time stoned and left for dead in Acts 14? Shipwrecked and on and on it went, right? Paul, you suffered most of your adult life, and your suffering was extremely intense. How could you call your sufferings light and momentary afflictions? They're momentary, Paul would say, in comparison to eternity, and they're light in comparison to the weightiness of glory that awaits us at the return of Christ. Paul said in Romans 8.18, For I, considering that the suffer I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so if we want to be able to rejoice in the midst of our suffering, we need to remember that, folks. And that's precisely what Peter's saying here. He's saying our circumstances are only temporary. We'll be home real soon, guys. He says in verse 5 that we're waiting for a salvation that is what? Ready to be revealed. It won't be long now. It may feel long in this life because this is all we've ever known, but in the big picture, it won't be much longer. It's only now for a little while, Peter says. And this reassurance brings comfort when times are hard, knowing that one day we'll be with our Savior forever. And as John says in Revelation 21.4, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, John says. The curse and all the effects of the curse, the pain of suffering and persecution will be fully, finally, and forever removed. Peter says you need to remember that if you want to greatly rejoice in the midst of your suffering. Well, third, if you want to be someone who rises above adversity and rejoices in the midst of suffering, you must not only refocus your hope on your future inheritance, verse 6a, you must not only remember that your circumstances are only temporary, verse 6b, but third, you must re recognize that your trials are necessary to God's plan, verse 6c. You must recognize that your trials are necessary to God's plan. And here what Peter does is he directs our attention to the sovereignty of God. He reminds us that nothing will ever come into our lives except by the perfect sovereign will of the Lord. Notice here in verse 6, two simple words, but very profound words. If necessary. See those two words? Peter writes, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while... If necessary, and the way that this is in the Greek construction is, and it is necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. If necessary. The idea here is that if you're experiencing distress because of various trials, listen, it's because God has deemed it necessary. 
It's because God has decided that it is needful in moving you towards Christ-like holiness. In other words, Peter's readers very well may have to suffer, but if and when they do, they should take comfort in the fact that their suffering is deemed necessary by God himself and is in accordance with his perfect will and his eternal purposes and plan. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that comforting? I mean, can you imagine to be without God and without hope in this world and to undergo the suffering and adversity that is part of living in this fallen world? Can you imagine thinking that it's all without purpose, that it's all in vain, it's all meaningless? It's all because of what? I don't know, but it hurts. What a privilege we have to be the children of God, to cling to the hope that when we suffer, it's fulfilling God's purposes in our lives. It's not in vain. It's not meaningless. It's not purposeless. It's according to the will of God in order to accomplish the good and wise and holy, loving purposes of God. Peter says over in 1 Peter 3, 17, for it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. And so if God's purpose for you is that you suffer for doing what's right, then you recognize that there's something good and needful in that suffering for you. Like the psalmist said in Psalm 119, it's good that I was afflicted, right? He says in 1 Peter 4, 19, Therefore, those also who suffer, watch this, according to the will of God, shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Peter says it's the will and purpose of God that you suffer. How's that for a prosperity gospel? Now, sometimes we may not understand what God is doing in our suffering. Sometimes we may not fully understand all of God's purposes in our suffering. But according to Scripture, God has many good and wise and holy and loving purposes in our suffering, and we need to trust Him and His purposes in the midst of it. Trusting His wisdom and goodness and sovereignty. Trusting His purposes and plans that it's wisest and best and that He truly does have our best interest at heart. That he's always and only working all things together for our greatest and highest everlasting good, Romans 8, 28. And therefore, we'll, we will trust him. We'll trust that if we knew all that he knew, we would have ordered our circumstances no differently than he's ordered them. That's what true faith is, folks. We will trust and believe, as Peter says here in verse 6, that our suffering is indeed necessary and needful. We will trust that God's providence is always perfect, no matter how perplexing or painful it might seem to us. We will trust that God's purposes and plans are always wisest and best. That God does have good purposes in our sufferings. What are those purposes? Well, there's so many. Let me just briefly give you a few. You're not going to have time to write them down. You can see me afterwards if you want them. But first, God uses suffering in our lives to produce maturity and holiness and perseverance. Romans 5, 3 to 5, Hebrews 12, 10, James 1, 2 to 4. Second, God uses suffering in our lives to provide a unique means to mediate his comfort to us and to prepare us to comfort others when they go through trials, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 7. Third, God uses suffering in our lives to give us an eternal perspective and to prepare us for future glory, Romans 8, 18, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Fourth, God uses suffering in our lives to increase our dependence upon Christ and to compel us to trust Him in ways that we never would had everything been going smoothly. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Fifth, God uses sufferings in our lives to produce contentment within us, realizing that anything beyond hell is mercy and that any pain and suffering we experience in this life is infinitely less than the hell we actually deserve. That any good we experience in this life is infinitely more than what we actually deserve. And therefore, we ought to be humble and grateful and thankful and content in all circumstances. And suffering helps us to realize that, just like it did with Paul in Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Six, God uses suffering in our lives to reveal human weakness so that the surpassing strength and glory of God may be evident. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 12. Seventh, God uses suffering in our lives to wean us from our attachment to this temporal world and to cause us to long for heaven. 
Eighth, God uses suffering in our lives to help us to understand and appreciate more fully Christ's sufferings on our behalf. Ninth, God uses suffering in our lives to increase our intimacy with Christ as we fellowship with him and his sufferings, Philippians 3.10. Tenth, God uses suffering in our lives to promote missions and to provide a unique platform for propagation of the gospel. Philippians 1, 12 to 14. Colossians 1, 24. Eleventh, God uses suffering in our lives to purify us and prune us and prepare us for greater fruitfulness. John 15, 2. Twelfth, God uses suffering in our lives to grow, refine, purify, and prove our faith, as we're going to see right here in this context. When we go through suffering, folks, unbelief is exposed. The impurities of our faith are purged away and our faith is refined and strengthened. And not only that, but when we respond to suffering with humble faith and obedience, rejoicing in God rather than railing against God, it validates and proves that our faith is real. When the things of this world begin to get hammered as we go through suffering, and we do not let go of Christ, but we instead let go of the things of this world, it proves that our faith is real. That it's really Christ we're clinging to and not the world. It shows, as Hebrews 10, 34 says, that we have a greater and a lasting possession in Christ, and therefore we can rejoice even in the plundering of our property. But whatever the purpose may be, whatever God's purpose is in suffering, and to whatever degree we may understand these purposes, we can be sure that there is a purpose and that it's needful and necessary according to the infinite and impeccable wisdom of God. We can be sure that nothing has slipped God's notice as though suffering just kind of accidentally and unnecessarily found its way into our lives. It's not like that, folks. God is not up there going, wow, I didn't see that coming. I can't believe what's going on in so-and-so's life. I can't believe the trial and suffering they're going through. I've been sleeping on the job. What am I going to do now? Not at all. Everything is happening right on schedule. God is in charge. God is in absolute control. God is meticulously sovereign over all of life, even the most minute details. Not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from his will. Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. There are no maverick molecules in this universe, as R.C. Sproul says. Everything is happening in accordance with the sovereign will and purpose and plan of God. In accordance with the eternal decree of God. And perhaps few people have understood this truth as well as a man named Thurman Kemp. Thurman was a student at the Toccoa Falls Bible Institute in Georgia back in 1977. And in that year, the Toccoa Falls Dam broke and drowned 39 people, one of whom was Thurman's seven-year-old son. Now, Thurman could have fallen into despair and helplessness. He could have shaken his fist at God and become angry and bitter and discontent. But do you know how he responded to that tragedy? He was quoted in the newspaper saying this, quote, Things happen for a purpose, and if God had wanted that dam to hold... He could have done it with a band-aid, end quote. Isn't that amazing? I read that and thought about my own son, Jose, and I thought, would that have been my response? Would that have been my perspective? I know it's true, but do I have that kind of faith that will really take God at his word, that things happen for a purpose, and if God had wanted that dam to hold, he could have done it with a band-aid. Why was Thurman able to rejoice in the midst of this kind of profound tragedy? Because he recognized that with God there are no accidents. That this was a necessary component of God's sovereign will and purpose and plan for his life in a way that I'm sure he didn't fully understand. But he knew God and he trusted God and therefore he had hope and joy even in the midst of tragedy and trial. Let me ask you, is that how you respond to trials and suffering? Is your re response one of recognizing that God is accomplishing his good and needful purposes in my life? That this suffering is needful and purposeful and I'm thankful for it? Or when you face various trials, is your response one of frustration and anger and bitterness and self-pity? Kicking and screaming. Railing and raging against God and his purposes. 
Peter says the moment you face adversity of some kind, trial of con some kind, suffering of some kind, difficulty of some kind, may your mind immediately recognize that the sovereign God of the universe is accomplishing his good and wise and holy and loving purposes in your life. That this has been ordered and orchestrated by him for your good, for a needful purpose. John Calvin put it this way, quote, all those who regard their troubles as necessary, not only rise above them, but also turn them to an occasion for joy, end quote. And so if we're going to rejoice in the midst of suffering, first, we need to refocus our hope on our future inheritance. Second, we need to remember that our circumstances are only temporary. Third, we need to recognize that trials are necessary to God's plan. And fourth, fourth key to rejoicing in the midst of suffering, relish the preciousness of the imperishable, verse 7. Relish the preciousness of the imperishable, verse 7. Now, throughout this epistle, this is one of those themes that comes up again and again. Throughout this epistle, Peter reminds his readers of the supremacy or the preciousness of that which is imperishable over against that which is perishable. For example, in chapter 1, verse 4, he points them to an inheritance that is both imperishable and unfading. In chapter 1, verse 18, he reminds them that they were redeemed not with perishable things like silver or gold, but rather with precious blood. In chapter 1, verse 23, he tells them that they were born again, not with seed which is perishable, but imperishable. In chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, he exhorts the women not to focus merely on external appearance, but rather on the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Chapter 5, verse 4, he reminds the elders that when Christ, the chief shepherd, returns, they will receive the unfading crown of glory. Again and again, we find that Peter emphasizes this need to relish the preciousness of that which is imperishable. And here in chapter 1, verse 7, we find this very same principle. It's not explicitly stated, but it's implicit here in the text. And as we come to verse 7, it's important to realize that Peter is now introducing the purpose of the suffering of these believers. What is the purpose? Why do they suffer? Now, it's not a comprehensive answer, but it is an answer nonetheless. Notice that Peter writes, starting at the end of verse 6, you have been distressed by various trials. Why? For what purpose? Notice the explicit purpose clause. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the first purpose of trials that Peter mentions here is that they prove our faith. They show the genuineness of our faith. Peter says trials come upon us so that our faith can be tested and proven genuine. Not to God, but to us. He already knows whether our faith is real, but we need to know. That's the meaning of the word proof here. The genuine character of your faith is exposed during the midst of trials and shows whether your faith is real or not. And notice that Peter compares faith to gold here. Now, sometimes we use the expression fool's gold. And the point of that expression is that it's not real gold, right? It has the appearance of real gold, but it's not real gold. It has to be put to the test to determine whether it's real and genuine or not. And so what Peter's saying here is that the trials have the effect of testing the genuineness of our faith to see if it's the real thing or not. And throughout the New Testament, the biblical writers appeal back in many ways to what Jesus taught in the parable of the sower to show this truth that many times people seem to respond to the gospel in faith, but then when trials come, what happens? They fall away, not losing the salvation they once had, but proving that they were never truly saved. And so the trials and persecutions exposed the fact that their faith was not genuine. It was not the real thing. And Peter wanted his readers to understand that one of the purposes of the trials in our lives is to prove the authenticity of our faith. Because when trials come, true faith doesn't wither. It lasts, it endures, it doesn't fall away. It doesn't turn to look somewhere else or to look to someone else. It clings to Christ alone. But then Peter goes on here in verse 7 to tell us that not only do trials prove our faith, but they also purify our faith as well. Here's the second purpose. 
Not only do they prove our faith, but they purify our faith. Notice Peter writes here, you have been distressed by various trials. Why? For what purpose? So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the imagery here is that you take a piece of gold and you put it in the fire and all the non-gold elements are burned up and removed. The dross, the impurities are burned away and the gold is purified in that way. And so Peter says that trials in our lives have that effect of doing that. The elements of our faith, which are impure, can be burned out or removed so that what's left is a stronger, more pure trust and faith in God. It exposes and removes impurities in our faith. It removes the shallow and selfish elements of our faith. You see, far too often people move toward God solely for what God will give them in the here and now. They're not worshipers of God, they're idolaters. And when they don't get what they want, if they have genuine faith, that selfishness that's there is actually burned away. If they're genuine in their faith, they keep moving toward God, even if their immediate circumstances don't change. Even if they don't get what they were initially seeking. Because it's genuine faith. And so they keep moving toward God. They keep trusting in God. Those that have a false faith, a counterfeit faith, however, when they move toward God and they don't get what they want, circumstances aren't going their way, they turn away to look for someone or something else. To find their source of comfort, their source of satisfaction. The difference between those two is ultimately what is the desire of the heart. The one that keeps moving towards God wants God. The one that turns away from God wanted only what God would give them. And when they didn't get it, they turned away from God to find their satisfaction elsewhere. And so we need to look at trials from the standpoint of the value that they have and that they bring into our lives. Because if we cling to God in the midst of our trials, they not only prove that our faith is genuine, but they also purify and strengthen our faith, burning away all the impurities of our faith, all the selfish motives in our faith. Peter says in verse 7 that even though gold is precious, the proving and purifying of our faith is more precious than that. Why? Listen carefully. Because gold will eventually perish, folks, along with everything else in this world. But genuine God-approved faith is imperishable. It lasts. It endures. And so here's gold, which in that culture was deemed to be the most precious, the most durable, the most treasured and prized and valued of all earthly possessions. And people says, as for its value, it cannot even begin to compare or touch genuine God-approved faith. He says, the proof of your faith is more precious than gold. Why? Because gold, even though it is tested by fire, is perishable. It won't last. It exists only for a season and then it's gone. But in contrast, Peter says, the proof of your faith is imperishable. And we know that because verse 7 says, watch, it will be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when gold and silver and everything else in this world that we tend to value and prize and set our hearts and affections on, when all those things are long gone, genuine faith will be receiving God's approval at the judgment on the last day. That's the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ that Peter talks about in verse 7. Now, certainly, as Tom Schreiner notes, there is a secondary sense in which praise and glory and honor also redound to God from us, since he's the one who empowers believers to persevere in faith, chapter 1, verse 5. But the emphasis here is clearly on the reward that believers receive from God. And the praise, honor, and glory that God gives to believers on the last day for their God-empowered, God-approved faith. You see, gold is valued in the sight of men, but is perishable. But genuine faith is valued in the sight of God and is imperishable and receives his praise on the last day. And what that means ultimately is that temporary trials will be replaced with eternal glory and honor and praise. You see, right now, remember, Peter's readers are not receiving praise and glory and honor. Instead, they're being slandered and ill-spoken of. They're getting the anti-praise, the anti-glory, the anti-honor because of their genuine faith in Christ. But Peter says, do you know what? Because of your genuine faith, 
God will say something vastly different at the revelation of Christ. That is when Christ, who is now invisible, is revealed at his return. God's approval and commendation of your faith will be very different than what your persecutors are saying about you now. You understand that, folks? You may be receiving persecution from coworkers and family members and friends, but guess what? God's going to say something different on the last day. So Peter says in verse 13 that we're to fix our hope on that, on the return of Christ and the grace that will come to us when we receive not only our final inheritance and full salvation, but God's commendation for our genuine faith. And so we must always be on the lookout for that which is valued in the sight of God and praised by God rather than that which is valued by the world and praised by the world. And we must set our hearts upon those things. All of these trials, Peter says, will end and the result for the true believer whose faith has been proven and purified through suffering will be praise and glory and honor when Christ returns. And so Peter's concern here is that we would relish and cherish that which is imperishable. Unlike the gold, right? That's the underlying principle here. Peter's concern is that we would regard the imperishable as having more value than the perishable. And so when you're encountering various trials and you find yourself struggling to respond with joy, step back and ask yourself, what is it that I'm regarding as most precious and most valuable at this very moment? Because it could be that your failure to rejoice in the midst of your suffering and trial is due to the hard issue of failing to relish the preciousness of that which is imperishable, namely your faith. It could be that you're failing to regard as precious what is precious in the sight of God, genuine faith which is being tested and proven and purified by this trial and suffering. Therefore, I can rejoice in the midst of the suffering because I know what God's doing. He's proving my faith. He's purifying my faith. But if all I care about is the idolatry of attention-free, trouble-free, trial-free, comfort-filled life, and I don't really value my faith and seeing it proven and purified and strengthened and matured through trials and suffering and one day approved and praised by God himself, then I'll never be able to rejoice in the midst of suffering. And so Peter says, relish the preciousness of the imperishable. Well, fifth and finally, we must rely upon and love him who is unseen, verses 8 and 9. We must rely upon and love him who is unseen. Notice what Peter writes here in verse 8. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Now, if you notice in this verse, Peter cites two obstacles that his readers have to overcome in their faith. First, they have not seen him. That is, they've never seen Christ. They will see him when he returns, verse 7, but they've never seen him. And second, they do not see him now. And so Peter says here that a genuine faith that truly trusts in Christ, that is, that believes in him and truly loves Christ, that is, is loyally devoted to him, even without seeing him. That's what true faith is. It trusts Christ, it believes in him, and it loves him, it's loyally devoted to him, even without seeing him. Now, the culture we live in says seeing is believing, right? You've got to see it to believe it. But what does the writer of Hebrews say in Hebrews 11.1? 1? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things what? Not seen. And so Peter says in verse 8, And though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And so here's the second great concession in this passage. The first was in verse 6. Peter says, you greatly rejoice even though you've been distressed by various trials. Now he says in verse 8, you greatly rejoice even though you've not seen him and don't currently see him. You've chosen to trust and to be lovingly and loyally devoted to someone whom you've never seen. That's true faith. You see, Peter's basically saying even though you've never seen Christ, you genuinely love him. You have an intimate, personal relationship with him. He's the object of your affection and love and devotion. Furthermore, he says you believe in him. Though you've never visibly seen him, you've come to believe in him through the word of others, right? 
Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word about Christ, Romans 10, 14. Jesus said that they will believe through your word, the apostles' word, John 17, 20. And so Peter says, you believe in him. That is, you trust in him, you rely upon him, you rest your confidence in him, you depend upon him. You who are distressed by various trials greatly rejoice. Why? Because you trust. Your, your trust and your faith and your confidence is fixed. Listen. Not in the circumstances that surround you, that everyone can plainly see, but in the one whom you cannot see and the one whom you have never seen. That's pretty radical, but that's the Christian faith. How about you tonight? Do you trust him and rely upon him? Do you love him? Is he precious to you? Is he the supreme object of love and affection of your soul? And is it clearly manifested in a life of faith and obedience to him? Because Jesus himself said in John 14, 15, if you love me, what? You'll have warm, fuzzy feelings towards me? You'll make a profession of faith? You'll keep my commandments as the ongoing pattern and practice of your life, not give me just lip service. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you, John, uh, Luke 6, 46? You see, true love for Christ, biblically speaking, is not merely emotion, but devotion. It's not merely sentimental feelings of affection for Christ, but a devoted following of Christ, of commitment and allegiance and loyalty to Christ. It's a commitment to believe what he says and to obey what he said. It's a supreme affection for him. We take pleasure in Christ more than anyone or anything else. We're committed to Christ above everything else, and that issues forth an uncompromised allegiance and devotion to him. And here in verse 8, Peter's readers had manifested their commitment to Christ. Watch, in love, trust, and joy. See that? Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. They loved Christ more than the things of this world. They believed in him, so they didn't rest in the world and the promises it offers to us, but instead they trusted and rested in Christ and in his word and in his promises. And because of that, they had a joy that was inexpressible and full of glory. On a human plane, it made absolutely no sense. You see, they were not trusting in the experience of the moment, i.e. their circumstances, to supply their satisfaction for them. Instead, they were convinced of and trusting in someone that they could not see and had never seen, namely the reality of the person and work of Christ and the promised future inheritance and salvation that he would bring with him when he returns. When they saw those realities with the eye of faith, they could hardly contain themselves. They were filled with the joy, Peter says, inexpressible and full of glory. And that rejoicing was the evidence of genuine faith. And that faith is enduring. It can't be chased away by trials. It's a faith that's come to see Christ as, as being worth more than whatever it is that's being taken away from you at the present time in your trial. Christ is worth more than whatever this trial is touching right now. And because faith has embraced Christ, the source of our joy can never be taken away. You see, some people's joy constantly goes up and down like a roller coaster, and the reason is because their joy is ultimately bound to the track of their circumstances. But for Peter's readers, it was different. Their joy was not tied to the ever-changing circumstances that they could see, but rather it was tied to the never-changing Christ whom they could not see. At least not with their physical eyes, but they had seen him with the eye of faith. And they had believed in him, and they truly loved him, or were loyally devoted to him. And as a result, they greatly rejoiced in him, despite their circumstances and suffering. Because that's what true faith is, and that's what true faith does, folks. And so let me ask you, does that describe you tonight? When times are hard and suffering is intense, do you find that your joy is untouchable because the source of your joy is unchangeable, namely the unseen Christ? Or does your joy go up and down because it's rooted in the things of this world? Notice, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, but believe in him. Watch this. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Not you find a way to just somehow squeak by. Not you grit your teeth and endure it. 
Not even that you just rejoice, but you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Let me ask you, does that describe you tonight? Can you relate to that? In at least some measure, is this completely foreign to you? You know nothing of rejoicing when trials come. Peter's readers had never seen Jesus face to face like Peter had. They'd never walked with him or talked with him or touched him. They'd never heard his voice or listened to his sermons or seen his miracles like Peter had. And yet Peter says they loved him and believed in him and devoted their entire lives to him because that's what true faith does. And as a result, they were even able to rejoice in him. What did Jesus say to Thomas in John 20, 29? Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. That was Peter's readers. They had not seen him, but loved him and believed in him and devoted their lives to him. And as a result, they rejoiced greatly with joy that was beyond the expression of words. It was full of glory. And then Peter writes in verse 9, obtaining as the outcome of your faith, that is, obtaining as the outcome of your genuine God-approved faith, which truly believes in the unseen Christ, which truly loves and is loyally devoted to the unseen Christ, and which greatly rejoices in the unseen Christ, even in the midst of trials, because you value Christ more than you value physical comfort or all the things that this world can offer you. Because of that faith, the outcome of that kind of genuine faith on the last day is the obtaining of the salvation of your souls. That is obtaining the full and final salvation of your soul, that is your, your entire person. The full possession of the blessings of salvation will be yours. And so Peter's saying that the full and final salvation that God has promised you is the outcome of your genuine faith, which truly lives for and rejoices in that which is unseen rather than the things of this world which can be seen. And so Peter wants us to understand here that God is to be praised because trials, listen, prove the genuineness of our faith. And the genuineness of our faith ultimately leads to final vindication, verse 7, praise and glory and honor, and final salvation, verse 9. And Peter says here that genuine faith reveals itself in deep joy, which can't be suppressed by trials. Listen, if trials can suppress and steal your joy, then your joy is not rooted in Christ. It's rooted in the things that you've lost, comfort, possessions, whatever it might be. Your joy is not in Christ, who He is and what He's done and what He's promised to do when He returns. But it's in some temporal thing in this world. And some treasure or pleasure from this world. And this trial has exposed that to be the case. The fact is, if your joy can be yanked around like that, it's because you're tied to the yo-yo of this world. You're going up and down with that instead of being anchored to something that cannot be moved by the trials of this life. Peter says in verse 4, we have a lasting inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. Nothing can touch it or take it. So if that's where your joy is, then your joy can't be touched or taken by suffering or circumstances. That's not where your joy is, it will be touched and taken. Also, Christ is in heaven. You can't see him, but you love him and believe in him. And if he's your joy, then nothing can touch or take your joy because he can't be touched or taken by your trials. He will not be changed and he will not turn from his promises towards you. So if your joy is anchored in who Christ is, what Christ has done, and what Christ has promised to you, when he returns, your joy will be great. It will be inexpressible. It will be full of glory. Because despite our present sufferings, we will see Jesus when he's revealed and we will enjoy him forever. In a glorified body, in a new heavens, and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. In the phone conversation that I alluded to earlier, I wasn't trying to set my friend up, but the question came back to me. I asked my friend if he was genuinely happy and he gave me his three reasons why he was. Then he asked me if I was genuinely happy. I had the opportunity to explain to him that I was. And it was not because the circumstances of my life were going precisely the way that I wanted them to go, but because God had caused me to be born again to a living hope and a lasting inheritance. He had given me genuine faith to turn from my sin and trust Christ alone. He had forgiven all my sins. I had the hope of eternal life. I have a hope that transcends this life transcends death, transcends the grave. Now, thinking back in retrospect, I realize that it's easy for me to sound all pious and to give that kind of answer, but the real test of where my heart is at and where your heart is at 
is not found in the answer that we give to the question, but the real test is found in how we respond to our trials. How we respond the next time the phone rings, or there's a knock at the door, there's news that we were not expecting, that we did not plan and that we do not like. If you and I are going to be ready when the moment arrives, if we're going to be characterized by genuine faith that manifests itself in great rejoicing by a joy that transcends our circumstances, then we be, need to begin to prepare now. It won't just happen on its own in the moment, folks. We must begin to cultivate this mindset and these hard attitudes now. How? Well, one, we need to refocus our hope on our future inheritance. Two, we need to remember that our circumstances are only temporary. Three, we need to recognize that our trials are necessary to God's plan. Four, we need to relish the preciousness of the imperishable. And five, we need to rely upon and love him who is unseen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the clarity of your word and what an anchor for the soul in the midst of suffering and trial. What a blessing this must have been for Peter's readers to receive revelation directly from you through the pen of the Apostle Paul. Life was bleak, circumstances were difficult, suffering was intense and unpleasant. And yet they had a joy that was inexpressible and full of glory because they had a genuine faith in the unseen. And the living resurrection hope that awaited them and the inheritance that awaited them and the salvation that awaited them and in the Christ that awaited them in his return. And Lord, if we're in Christ, we have these same hopes. I pray that we would fix and focus our hope fully on the grace to be brought to us at the return of Christ. Our joy would be tied to him and his promises to us and not anchored to anything in this world so that when the trials come, our joy is unaffected. It's untouched and it's untaken and that the world would look around and ask us as it scratches his head in bewilderment for the reason for the hope that lies within us and that we would always be ready to give a defense to talk about the hope that we have. And Lord, if any are here tonight or not in Christ who don't have this hope, who don't find joy in difficult times because all of their hope is tied to the things of this world and not to Christ and his return, that you would convict them of their sin and bring them to genuine saving faith. That they too might joy, rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory because of the hope that we have because of the person and work of Jesus Christ our Savior in whose name we pray. Amen.